that Steve Jobs, he um, when he was driving everyone to try to move from Mac OS 9 to Mac OS 10 when, 10, when he re-entered Apple, he did like probably one of the more dramatic um, ceremonies I've ever seen. And that was that he brought a coffin on the stage hmm. and he put a large oversized box of Mac OS 9 in it. <laughs> he shut the lid, he put a rose on it, and he eulogized Mac OS 9. And I know people that were there and um, you can actually hear the kind of the gasping, <laughs> <laughs> like, am I supposed to laugh? Is this funny? Right. You know, people didn't yeah. know what to do. But every single person in that room knew that from that day forward, they probably shouldn't develop on Mac OS 9 anymore. Oh, <laughs> you know, nice. it was just so clear. So he mm. was doing an ending so they could begin it again. What is going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining yours truly, Brian Calagiri, on this week's episode of Cut the Crap Podcast, where every week I'm reading a book, condensing it down to its core golden nuggets. I'm bringing the author on the show, have a conversation about the golden nuggets, and I'm here every single week with you, just trying to save you a little bit of time and bring you some information that can spark real change in your life. Now, don't forget, give me a follow. Follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can see what Ryan's doing, what he's up to throughout the week, other than just listening to me on the podcast. Also, don't forget to get your summaries. Go to cutthecrappodcast.com. At the very top there, at the header, you'll see a header that's called summaries. Sign up by giving me your name, your email address, and I'll make sure it gets into your inbox probably once a month, once every month, a uh, month and a half. Again, like I say every week, I just don't want to overload your inbox. Now, the last piece here. If you love the show, then please go online, rate, and review the show if you have the opportunity to do that. If you're listening on iTunes, um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, whatever, you can go ahead. You can leave me a rating, leave me a review. Stitcher, certain platforms, you can't do that. SoundCloud, Spotify. So just send me an email at podcast at But if you're using iTunes, Google Podcasts, whatever, send me a screen capture of that rating, of that review, and I'll make sure you get entered to the draw every quarter for a prize. And you know what we were doing this past quarter. I was trying to get you guys to give me ratings, give me reviews, so I can give away $1,000 in cash. That's it. That's it. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to give away money. Like Bob Barker over here giving away money. All right. So I'm very excited to say that we have a winner. Obviously, we have a winner. There are so many of you who are giving me ratings and reviews. So thank you, first off, to every single one of you who did that. And I hope that every single one of you have the opportunity to win in the future. But this quarter, we only have one winner. And that winner is none other than... I don't do dramatic drum rolls. I just do dramatic pauses. Lori Joe Weiss from Melbourne, Australia. So Lori Joe, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to review the show. It means so much to me and for all of you out there. Thank you so much. It means so much to me that you guys tune in every single week and that uh, you make me a part of your week. So thank you. And Lori Joe, you can expect an email from me very shortly and I will be sure to send over that $1,000 in cash. But don't forget... If you already did that, if you already sent me a rating and review, you are in the draw for next quarter's prize. And what that is, I haven't decided yet. I'll figure it out. But I have some time to figure it out because I'm heading to Kelowna in T-minus two hours. And the reason for this trip is not just because I want to take a trip, but it's my birthday. So I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to go out there with some friends, with some family, go out there to some wine country and uh, enjoy some wine, enjoy some good food, enjoy great conversation, great company. And uh, I can't wait to get out there. So yeah, it's my birthday. Turned, uh, I turned 21 today, everybody. 21. <laughs> now nah, I'm really excited, though. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I want to make sure I get this one out to all of you before I get out there. Because I'm putting the tech away, for the most part. And uh, just going to enjoy my time out there, enjoy the scenery. So I got to crack into this one before I take my flight out there. So what are we doing today? What are we cracking into? We are reading a good book. It's Illuminate. Ignite Change Through Speeches, Stories, Ceremonies, and Symbols by Nancy Duarte. As a communicator myself, as well, myself, we're all communicators. Every single one of you listen to this, you're a communicator. Whether you do it in the boardroom, whether you do it in the classroom, whether you do it individually, one-on-one, whether you do it with your family, with your friends, it doesn't matter. We're all communicating. We're all trying to be a little bit persuasive at times. And so how do you become persuasive? Well, Nancy Duarte believes that there's four techniques that you can use to become persuasive. And again, it's stories, speeches, ceremonies, and symbols. I think for the most part, we know about stories, we know about speeches, but symbols, ceremonies, I don't quite understand how those come into play. But even speeches and stories, we've all heard different aspects of how to use stories, how to use speeches, but Nancy really breaks it down and she provides us with some really good takeaways that we can all put into practice right away to become more effective communicators. 
So enough jibber jabber, I got a flight to catch. So I just want you guys to get into this one, enjoy it, and hit me up on social media afterwards. Let me know what you think. Let me know if any of these techniques you'll put into practice because I'm curious if um, if maybe ceremonies or symbols or something that you've never heard about before but you might want to try out. But in any case, I hope you enjoy this episode and of course, I will catch you back here at the end of the episode. Enjoy. Nancy, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for making time for myself and for everybody out there in Cut the Crap Podcast Nation. It's a, a pleasure having you on the show today. Uh, thanks for having me. This will be fun. Absolutely. Definitely going to be a lot of fun. So for anybody who doesn't know you yet, yet, Nancy, maybe tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Awesome. So I'm Nancy Duarte. We have been based in the Silicon Valley. We just celebrated our 30th year. I, we're older oh. than Facebook, Google, and all the guys. So. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So we have a firm that specializes in presentations. We're a communication firm that will help you write, uh, design, and deliver a great talk. So mm. that's what we do. Uh, there's an opportunity for people to communicate a lot more stronger using different techniques. And I think this is where really, again, your firm is really successful and your book is very important for anybody out there, whether you're in sales, whether you're in marketing, whether you're in strategy, if you communicate, then you got to read this book because we all have to be effective communicators. So I really, really enjoyed this book. And I think it does apply to uh, a wide gamut of people out there. So Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, if you're into marketing, uh, then you came to this podcast because you want to hear this book, then fantastic. If you're in sales, strategy, even in technology, HR, it doesn't matter. This book applies to all of you because every single one of us has to communicate. So for Golden mm-hmm. Nugget number one, you say that successful, sustainable organizations, they need these visionaries. They need these torchbearers. So tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about who these torchbearers are first off. Yeah, I think um, a torchbearer is someone who has a dream that needs to be communicated. Now, that sounds lofty. That sounds very Martin Luther King-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, we liken it to and I'm sure a lot of your listeners have felt this, but it's like it it burns in your belly and it just has to happen. It just has to happen. You just know it has to happen. And so we took that concept of of light and bearing light and we picked a torch on purpose because when you're going into the unknown and you're traveling into unknown territories, it's dark, it's scary. It's kind of like being in a cave, right? And a torch only really lights a little bit of the space in front of you. We didn't say lighthouse so people can see you from 200 miles away. Mm. We said torch because you just have to light enough of a way to dissipate enough fear that's right in front of them to get them to take the next few steps. And all of that light is cast based on how you communicate. And so that's why um, we picked Torchbearer as a Mm. metaphor. That's a great, great term, and I like that a lot. But how do you develop yourself into a Torchbearer? How do companies develop their people into Torchbearers? Is that possible, or are people just born with that innate drive, that passion inside them? You know, it's interesting because at one point we had actually used the word seer or prophet, you know, Mm. so I don't know. You know, I I grapple with that sometimes. Why is it sometimes people will see some void and be like, I'll 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 go there or or see a need for a product and say, I'll make that. Some see the same product. I mean, they see the same idea, but they just choose to keep using the old failed way and other people rise to the challenge. Um, So I think about that a lot. I, I think. I think some people do have sometimes a divine ability Mm -hmm. to see and be a seer, but I also think uh, it's a do, it's a lot about doing, it's a lot about seeing the gap and doing something about it. Um, So I don't know, you know, I spend a lot of time on my hikes thinking through why leaders rise and others just don't. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you see it in your own organization. I see it in mine. Like there's these gaps in leadership and, and, and some people rise and fill it and others just just like, Oh, there's a gap. Hey, Hey, there's Mm -hmm. a gap. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, if I knew that, I would solve a lot of le- a lot of the world's ails. You know, right? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. It it is tough though, and I think that people come to that becoming torchbearers. They come to that through their own experience, through their own pains, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sometimes it takes time. And That's sometimes you can look for it, but. I think being aware of it first off, being aware that, you know, you have this power within you to drive great change. I think first off, having that self-awareness is important. Number two is just to being able to find that challenge that does ignite your passion. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's business related. Maybe it's not business related. I know a lot of people who retired from their jobs or quit their jobs to go and be a torchbearer in a completely different industry. I know an individual who quit their job and they ended up going in and working for um, the Humane Society and doing their thing with dogs and going up to areas where dogs were mistreated and taking care of them and really driving change in certain organizations that way. And 
you just got to yeah. do a little bit of self-discovery and find within you, mm-hmm. you know, what, what that passion is. And again, Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, it's not going to come to you easy. It takes time. It takes a lot of self-discovery. And sometimes it just takes the right problem in order to ignite that for you. Mm-hmm. So, exactly. So, Nancy, do you have a story of somebody who is a torchbearer that we can maybe relate a little bit ourselves to? Um, One of my favorite, favorite torchbearers is a guy named Scott Harrison, Mm. who runs a nonprofit called Charity Water. And one of the things that makes him a a particularly special torchbearer is his ability to wield stories at the right time. His own organization was born out of um, his own... um, kind of his own death, burial, and resurrection story, for lack of a better way to say it. But he went through his own personal sense of renewal, and then this whole nonprofit was founded on that. And then he perpetuated storytelling. And there's a moment um, that we talk about in the book where he, too, was like, I'm tired. I don't know if I can keep going. And a lot of the role of a torchbearer is to have the right emotional fuel for your followers. The pe- your, we call them your travelers because there's the torchbearer and the travelers. Mm-hmm. You've got to have the right emotional fuel at the right time. And when a leader runs out of their own emotional fuel, they need to find a way to find it again. And there's a story in here about how he um, had always heard a rumor of this little gal who um, went and traveled all day and all day back to go get water um, for her little village. And when she came back, the pot broke and uh, she was so distressed she killed herself. Uh Little 13-year-old girl. So he went on a quest to find the family of that little girl and he found them. And so he he did it because he wanted to fall in love with why he's committed his life Mm -hmm. to clean water. So he found a story that's going to fuel him for a whole nother decade, right? And so it's it's very interesting. I think as leaders, sometimes we're so concerned about the emotional fuel of our travelers that sometimes we don't we don't take care mm-hmm. of ourselves. I feel like I'm coming through a season like that where mm. I was low on my own fuel and that made everyone else a little empty themselves, you know? Yeah. And, um, and it's nice to be kind of, um, uh, full again, you know? Of course. So, yeah. Wow. I, I love Scott Harrison. I think he's one of the greatest communicators right now. It's hard to fill the gap of Steve jobs and others. Right. Of course. Um, but I just, I really adore um, what he's doing Absolutely. and how he communicates. So, Absolutely. It might be a new name for all of you out there in Cut the Crap Podcast Nation to look up if you've never heard of him before. And if you haven't picked up the book and read it yet, maybe do a little bit of digging into uh, Nancy's good friend there, Scott. But um, th- again, when you talk about torchbearers, when you talk about their mission that they're on, to be a torchbearer, you have to be an effective communicator. There's no, there's no question about it. So mm-hmm. to be an effective communicator, this is what brings us to golden nugget number two. So mm-hmm. this comes down to understanding the four communication techniques. Speeches, storytelling, ceremonies, and symbols. To be an effective torchbearer, to drive your, 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 your passion forward, in order to drive change in the world, you need to be an effective communicator. When we go through each, of, each and every single one of these, maybe Nancy, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what it means to leverage some of these pieces and maybe give us some tips in terms of how we can approach one uh, in the most effective uh, manner possible. So the very first one, speeches. Talk to us about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these four tools every leader needs to have in their toolkit. We tend to be uh, kind of spoken word specialists. You know, a lot of people focus on getting clicks and getting, you know, (laughs) other forms. But once you've spent all that money and you get the right people in the room, how you communicate verbally makes a massive amount of difference. And so speech making is what our business has been based in forever. We work with the greatest brands and thought leaders helping them make their speeches. They show up, they're on stage. What speeches do is create longing. So there's this actual structure, a discovery that I made. I studied the greatest speeches after spending four years studying storytelling and I made a discovery. And that is that every great speech has a structural form Mm. that where you move between what is and then you move to what could be, what is, what could be, what is, what could be. Now what is, is rarely as good as what could be. Like we can always find something that's wrong with the status quo or broken about today. Mm -hmm. And what could be creates a longing for a brighter future of tomorrow. So humans are just hardwired for contrast. And that contrast between what is and what could be um, propels your audience forward into this new new picture of this new future that you're trying to create. And that's what the great speeches do is they Mm -hmm. propel people forward um, as they're trying to draw drive a movement. 
Right. It really motivates them. It excites them yeah. and almost wants them to essentially abandon their status quo and, exactly. and, and dive right into, yep. you know, a change process or, or something yeah. that, that drives change. Yeah. I really like that. And again, Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, how many of you have been stirred by words before from remarkable yeah. speeches, whether it was from, you know, Martin Luther King or that classic speech by uh, Charlie Chaplin. Um, you know, there's just so many different speeches that have been delivered by by presidents, by uh, by CEOs, by actors, where you've been moved to tears sometimes or just felt emotion. That's the power of speech that people have. For us as communicators, it's so incredibly important for us to start leveraging speeches and leveraging that technique that Nancy just shared with us because that by itself can help you all of a sudden become a little bit more of an effective communicator. But it does take practice though, right? It's not going to come yeah. overnight just because you understand that there's so many different nuances to it like like tone and the speed of your speech and it practice makes perfect. Just because you know this doesn't mean you're going to be great at it all of a sudden, but you got to start somewhere. So exactly. Th- the second piece here storytelling. Now, we all know the importance of storytelling. We had Seth Godin on a couple months ago talking about the importance of story as you drive change forward. We had him on talking about linchpin. And we've all heard the importance of stories and, and the the impact that stories have on people. But for some reason, I don't know why we forget the importance of telling stories. So remind everybody out there in Cut the Crap Podcast Nation, Nancy, why we need to use stories to be effective communicators. Well, you can use stories in a speech. You can use stories as a theme for your speech. But what's fascinating about stories is that they're about transformation. So there's a classic three-act structure of a story. And that is, act one is that there's this this likable hero. Act two is that they go through, they encounter roadblocks. You can call it the messy middle. Act three is that they were changed because of the messy middle. So one of the reasons leaders struggle to tell stories, especially personal stories, A personal story told with great conviction will transform hearts and minds more than anything else in the world. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons leaders resist is because of the messy middle. They have Mm -hmm. to stand up and say, hey, I'm this likable person, went through this really messy Mm -hmm. thing, and this is what I learned from it. A lot of people won't be transparent and authentic and say that life is hard, but life is hard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I will follow a leader that fails and talks about it before I'll follow a leader who pretends they're perfect. And I think what's happening is, I think even with regulations and SEC, CEOs have to be so careful with what they say today. But once, like we just worked with the CEO of a really big, huge public company, Mm. always was really in his um, talks, he was always very self-congratulatory, like, well, in my previous job, (laughs) I was was awesome. (laughs) And at this one, I'm awesome, and I'm going to continue to continue to be awesome. And we got him to just talk about one time he failed, and it was a big risk. So Mm. he picked something that wasn't even that fascinating to fail at, right? (laughs) He did it, and the outpouring of affection wow. from the team was uh, unparalleled. Wow. He said it was by far the best speech because the out the feedback was he was more human. He came across right. as authentic. People want to know you're flawed. Mm-hmm. They, you know, and then and then they know. Oh, you learned that mistake at your last job. You mm-hmm. won't make that mistake with us. Oh, yay! I'll follow you. You know, That's right. but we forget the nature of how beautiful these are as instruments and tools to actually help people bind our hearts to each other, mm-hmm. to actually help people understand the moral lesson or why we're headed places and um, they wield incredible power and beauty and yet you're right we so often forget and put it leave it on the cutting room floor yeah right the one thing I always find though when it gets come to storytelling and you mentioned it there the importance of being authentic and Today, mm-hmm. there's far too many companies out there, far too many people out there, whether it's, you know, on their videos on Instagram or through their website where everything is perfect. You know, my life is perfect. I don't make mistakes. I love and I, I'm sure you love and everyone out there in Cut the Crap podcast loves the people who are showing their human side. They're showing mm-hmm. that, you know, I make mistakes. I do fail. And for some reason, when you start to see that, it kind of breaks the mold a little bit. It's like, hold on a second. What did this person do? And your example there, your story there uh, told it perfectly, right? It just, It's just for some reason, the minute that you start to show a little bit of vulnerability, um, people perk up and they respect that. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. that's just something that we have to be more cognizant of as well, too, for everyone out there building personal brands. Maybe that's something to keep in hmm. mind yourself as well. So the third piece here. Ceremonies. It's not something that we hear too much about when we're talking about creating uh, effective communication strategies or being effective communicators. So tell us a little bit about this idea of using ceremonies. 
Yeah, you know, we spent a lot of time um, looking at different story forms. And believe it or not, ceremony also follows a three-act structure. If you look at the traditional um, cultural and religious uh, rites of passage, you have like the bar mitzvah, the quinceanera, even a wedding. Mm. You you come to this ceremony as one thing, like at a wedding. You come, you show up single, you go through a small ceremony, and you leave having in-laws now, <laughs> or, you know, a small boy uh, goes through a little ceremony, and then they re-enter their ordinary world as a man. So there's this Something about a ceremony demarcates that one thing has ended and a new thing has begun. Mm. And it's so many times when we're driving change and we're driving a movement and we're really trying to make change in the world, people cling to the past. They cling to it hard. And there's moments in time where we need to say old things are past and it's time to be new again. And and if you don't create a really hard line, sometimes we forget as leaders, we so move on. We're so quick to move on. Oh, that failed. Let's move on. Well, other people People cling to that thing that failed and um, and you have to give them the freedom to mourn its loss and re-enter the world without that thing clinging to them again and there's all kinds of examples in the book of all different kinds of ceremonies one um, that a friend of mine does there's a guy named Astro Teller he runs Google X and he <laughs> he they invent so many things and they come up with so many ideas but they can't pursue all these ideas so these people get all excited they have an idea and he actually, on Dia de los Muertos, which is the Day of the Dead, mm -hmm. they actually create an altar. All the dead ideas that people made during the year, mm -hmm. they lay down at the altar and they do a dance. They celebrate that they made and they tried oh. and, they move, and they move on. They let it go. Now, that's different. That's smaller change. Right. Um, but Steve Jobs, he um, when he was driving everyone to try to move – from Mac OS 9 to Mac OS 10 when, 10, when he re-entered Apple, he did like probably one of the more dramatic um, ceremonies I've ever seen. And that was that he brought a coffin on the stage hmm. and he put a large oversized box of Mac OS 9 in it. <laughs> he shut the lid, he put a rose on it and he eulogized Mac OS 9. And I know people that were there and um, you can actually hear the kind of the gasping, <laughs> <laughs> like, am I supposed to laugh? Is this funny? Right. You know, people didn't yeah. know it. <laughs> but every single person in that room knew that from that day forward, they probably shouldn't develop on Mac OS 9 anymore. Oh, <laughs> you know, nice. it's just so clear. So he mm. was doing an ending so they could begin it again. He's like, we're done. This yes. is done. It's over for Apple. So because a lot of developers still had not crossed over. And he's like, we're done. We've mm -hmm. moved on. You know, oh. and so it was very um, ceremony. And there's some that aren't that dramatic. I th feel like I gave two very dramatic examples <laughs> on your show. But there's just a whole lot of practical day to day. Like at uh, Nike, they did a they used to serve donuts every Friday. And when a, the project was done, the team carried the not on purpose. The, mm -hmm. People just react this way at an ending. They carried the donuts in like a pallbearer would and they stopped <laughs> serving donuts. And the following Monday when they started to meet again, it was all healthy snacks instead. <laughs> I mean, it's a dumb example. And when That's I started good. to interview people. And I'm like, have you ever done this? When they sat, they're like, oh, I did do that at the end of a pro. Or, You're right. We did do a ceremony. So it's not like it should be contrived right. and it shouldn't be, you know, forced on any organization. We do it naturally mm -hmm. at various scales, but we, nobody's ever really called it out as a ceremony of, of endings and beginnings until this book. Yeah. Yeah. And I absolutely love that. To me, it was, it's funny. This We've heard about speeches. We know, obviously, speeches. We know about storytelling. But ceremonies, that was new to mm -hmm. me. And I loved reading it because I've I've never thought about that, but the examples you shared the book, the examples you shared with us right now goes to show just how powerful that imagery was. Like when you go ahead and you tell us those examples and even the dramatic examples, I mean, you can kind of take those dramatic examples and dumb them down into something that's yeah. less dramatic, you know, and, yeah. and you get you get the picture. Ceremonies, I truly love that one. And this kind of leads us now to the last one, symbols. So symbols, again, maybe something that we don't hear too much about or that we probably don't leverage very much of at all when we're communicating. So introduce us to this idea of using symbols. Yeah, you know, symbol like a thing, a symbol is a thing. It could be a flag, it could be a trophy, it could be a poster, it could even be a um, surfboard. <laughs> what The reason it becomes symbolic is is because you shared a moment with someone. It became emotionally charged as a thing mm -hmm. uh, because of something that was shared. So if you look at things like a flag that people will rally behind uh, when they're protesting um, or um, 
something simple like let's say you you held an offsite and everyone and you had this poignant moment with your team and and you all went surfing that weekend you could give everyone a signed copy of a surfboard or <laughs> that's kind of big but you um <laughs> Things have no emotional value, a thing, a physical, tangible thing, um, only until it becomes significant because of the shared meaning. So in, in when you're driving communication and driving change, being cognizant of that's very important. So the way it would work is, let's say uh, you're a new leader in an organization and you're going to drive change. When you enter into that um, organization, you need to really quickly identify all the sacred symbols that are there, all the sacred cows, all the things that you just can't stomp on. Because if you even look at how we dispose of a U.S. flag, mm -hmm. the Boy Scouts, like you, there's all this ceremony around it. It's treated with incredible respect. Mm -hmm. You fold it a certain way. They do this whole ceremony. They do a reading and then they burn it in a very sacred way, right? That's because it's a, like almost like a sacred symbol, you could say. Well, the same thing happens in organizations. You can't just come in and start dismantling symbols of right. great power. You have to, you have to really carefully understand them. Some you can almost like amplify and others you have to diminish them from having any power. And then you create your own. You you rally around and you create your own symbols. In in my shop, our symbol's a giraffe, which mm. seems awesome because it was just World Giraffe Day on the 21st. <laughs> but um, what, how that became a symbol is interesting. We had been – one of my designers years ago – it's got to be 15 years ago. I need to look up the date. But hmm. she wanted to start a program where we um, honored each other, where we just said, oh, thanks for staying late. I got to go home and see my kids on time or, or whatever. whatever. And she wanted to publicly say at staff meetings uh, and pass something. Um, in the process that could be pay it forward. And she went to Cost Plus and she picked up this really evil looking tiki doll. It had red beady eyes. It looked evil. And so the first time she passed it, the guy that got it, Kevin, he's like, I love this program, Nancy, but this thing is freaking me out. I think it's a, de <laughs> it's, it's a demon. <laughs> so I was like, I'm so sorry, Kristen. I need you to go back to Cost Plus and get something different, right? So she picks up this little wooden giraffe that mm -hmm. sits on the edge of a table. So we started past a giraffe. We passed a giraffe for years and it was just the giraffe, right? And then when we we went through a really – this symbol's already in my shop, but I, I didn't – I don't know. It was just something we did. It was just a ceremony. We just did the ceremony. Every every Monday morning at staff meeting, we passed the draft. We went through a really tough time where I brought in a leader who made change, and it was painful, and, mm. and, and it was the wrong – um, decision. Yeah. And what happened is I thought I was traveling with an employee and they were like, blah, 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 this and blah, blah, blah. You know, I was like, oh, Jesus. Like, what is it called? I was like, what is it called when the giraffe rally together? What is it called when giraffes coalesce or they mm. create a herd? And I looked it up right then and it's called a tower. Mm. And I loved that a herd of giraffes is called a tower. There's it's a tower of giraffes mm. because that felt like a symbol of refuge. It felt like a symbol of strength. And I really wanted us to be a tower mm. in this season, a symbol of strength. So I came back from that trip and I said, you know what, I'm going to make this our official symbol. So it felt, it wasn't like me showing up one day and being like, guess what, y'all? Yeah. Our new symbol is a giraffe, <laughs> right? I found an, an emotionally charged symbol that was already in the culture and mm. I amplified it. And so now they're called giraffe formations. <laughs> we have thousands awesome. of them. We have giraffes <laughs> on t-shirts. We, we hide little giraffes in in it's communication brilliant. and then nobody knows what it means but abortion right. but it's very meaningful um to us so we just oh, we nice. just um adopted a giraffe on world giraffe day his, <laughs> no name's, way. Winky, winky, his name's winky wonk <laughs> he's so cute <laughs> so it's just important and then there's a whole lot of things about a giraffe once i did the research it was sitting here the whole time and when i researched mm -hmm. things about a giraffe is they're the, they're the um animal with the largest heart in the world wow. and it's just like then you start to mm -hmm. amplify some of the meaning and it just became perfectly beautiful and now that's definitely a symbol that we communicate through and can rally around oh, i love that again cut the crap podcast nation these are different communication techniques things that we really haven't heard a lot about and nancy really broke it down for us really nice and that story there by the way nancy was awesome like the, the oh. story about the draft i really really love that story and i'm glad that you shared that with everyone because uh, again that really crystallizes the importance of symbols so that speeches storytelling ceremony symbols those are your four communication techniques and like i said anybody anybody out there should be leveraging these and can leverage them to become a more effective communicator but now this leads us to our last golden nugget golden nugget number three which we talk about pursuing your transformation campaign and 
you have a five-step model for doing that. And we'll mm -hmm. go through the five-step model one by one. But the first one, dream. The second one, leap. The third one, fight. The fourth one, climb. And the fifth, arrive. So start us off with the first one. Lead us through the first one, dream, your moment of inspiration. Yeah. So we call this a venture scape. And what we did, um, I mentioned earlier, was we studied movements. How did MLK sustain, help sustain the civil rights movement? We even looked at um, digital movements. We looked at um, open source movements. We looked at every kind of movement. And um, when we overlaid storytelling on it, it created a three-act structure. Um, Dream Leap is act one. Fight, climb is the messy middle. That's act two. Mm. And arrive is like act three. Mm. So dream and leap are actually kind of a combined step in a way. Mm -hmm. um, you cast your dream. You say it out loud. If you do a really great job, sometimes they leap right away. So that's why dream leap could happen in a moment. Mm -hmm. But dream leap might need to have it happen over a whole series. It might take two years to get people to believe that you're making the right decision <laughs> and that they should jump in. So you're really trying to persuasively compel people to, you cast a dream, you're trying to get them to commit to your adventure. Now you're taking them on a call to adventure. Well, in any myth or movie, that call to adventure means you've left your ordinary world and you're going into a special, potentially scary and unknown world. That's why this messy middle is fight climb. Mm. And what happens is if you're trying to rally your employees to change your organization and turn it into something different, they jump in. They might follow you and jump in, but it gets messy and it yeah. gets hard and it becomes a battle. And then they start to ask themselves, oh, my God, what, what did I sign up? Why did I think this was a good idea? And this is the point where you have to – this is why you have to show up with the right emotional fuel. Each one of these steps, there's a certain type of speech, story, ceremony, and symbol at each one of these steps. Mm -hmm. One of them's a moti motivating, and the other one is a, a warning. So at each step, they need a different kind of emotional fuel. And fight, climb, it doesn't happen necessarily sequentially. It's like fight, climb, climb, mm -hmm. climb, fight, climb, fight, climb, climb, fight, fight. Because the messy <laughs> middle is the long part. That's, That's where right. they're executing. And there's a moment in storytelling. Um, Joseph Campbell put together the hero's journey, and it was a multi-part story structure. And there's a moment in there where the protagonist does what's called goes into their inmost cave. Uh, St. John of the Cross called it the dark night of the soul. Mm. And it's this moment where your employees or your investors or wh whoever it is you're taking on this journey with you, they're, they're going inward and they're saying, hmm, is this worth the reward? Is this risk and sacrifice I'm making worth the reward? Your employees mm. ask you that every day. And you need the right emotional fuel for them to get up put their feet on the floor the next day and really take off, you know, and really mm -hmm. stay in your journey. Because a lot of times, if they don't have the right fuel, when they're in the fight climb phase, they'll just peel away and work for somewhere else that doesn't look like, you know, it's as difficult. And so ultimately, once we work our way through the fight climb phase, ultimately you arrive mm -hmm. and the ending of your story hopefully is happy. Mm -hmm. But if it's not, if it's not, you still need this moment of demarcation to say, we tried and we failed. And this is when you need the endings and beginnings. The ceremony is very important when you arrive or you fail. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to communicate really, really clearly. You either celebrate the heroes or you mourn the loss um, in that final phase. So it's a it's like a pattern for a movement um, mm -hmm. called, called a venturescape. And that's what the uh, book, the structure of the book is based on dream, leap, fight, climb, arrive, and how you have the right kind of messages at each stage. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about this idea of, of the re-dream, so doing it all over again as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what's fun about that is that no sooner has everybody just about clawed their way out of the messy middle that the leader has already moved on. Like we're already like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, I already see the next vista. Right. <laughs> so they're just about, you know, they're just seeing the crest and you're already like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm so excited about the next thing. And and so our job as leaders is to redream. It's always to be in some sort of state of um, preparing for the future. But this is also why I think the arrival, the final act three is so um, um, overlooked because we're so excited about the next Vista and um, everyone needs to redream. Every organization needs to be in a state of reinvention at 30 years old. Um, we have been, we're on our eighth reinvention, which is interesting mm -hmm. because we reinvent about every four years, whether it's a repositioning or a massive overhaul of who we are in the marketplace. And the U S Bureau of labor and statistics says that Small businesses go out of business usually at the between the four and five year mark. So I do think every business needs to either reinvent or you die. And so this redream, if you look at 
uh, companies like we looked at companies like American Express, like IBM, and we could actually map out, I, even Apple and Amazon, and we mapped out Matt, HP, we mapped out a lot of these companies, and, and we could actually ra- draw S-curves of reinvention um, throughout their history. So the ones that transcend time, that I would call almost like an epic length tail organization, they reinvent. They reinvent anywhere from two, two to six years. Um, they're in, in a state of um, freshness all the time. Mm. Illuminate. Ignite change through speeches, stories, ceremonies, and symbols. Nancy, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing this awesome book with us. Uh, Nancy, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, if they want to reach out to you, if they want to see what you're up to, how can they go about connecting with you? Yeah, I have a website, uh, duarte.com. It goes through everything that we do here. I connect to anyone who connects to me on LinkedIn. My Twitter handle is at Nancy Duarte, and it'd be great to hear from you guys. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, again, Nancy, thank you so much again for coming on the show and for making time for myself and everyone out there in Cut the Crap Podcast Nation. It's a true pleasure. Awesome. Hey, you too. Thanks a ton. All right. There we have it. That's Illuminate. Ignite change through speeches, stories, symbols, and ceremonies by Nancy Duarte. Some really good takeaways from this one. And I know for a fact that myself, I'm going to start to incorporate a little bit more ceremonies, symbols into my communications. It's not easy. You got to figure out how to do it and the best way to do it. But that's the fun of it. That's the fun of it. And even how I can become a better storyteller. How I can become a better linguist and use speeches more effectively. But in any case, my friends, like I said, I hope you were able to take away some good things from this podcast episode. And uh, if you did, then please go online, rate and review the show as always. And make sure you get into the draw every quarter for a prize. And I'll figure out what that prize is in a couple weeks' time. But uh, leave me some ratings and some reviews. Also, don't forget to connect with me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, what's the other one? What's the other one? Oh, LinkedIn, obviously. My number one platform. How can I forget about that one? Also, don't forget to go to CutTheCrapPodcast.com. And at the very top, summaries. Don't forget to sign up for your summaries as well. I'll send that out very shortly. And my friends, I am done for the week. Taking the entire week off. Like I said, going to Kelowna. Enjoy my birthday. Have some good wine, some good food, and um, spend some time with some good people. So I'm very much looking forward to that and hope that all of you have a fantastic, productive week as well. And I'll catch you back here. Next week, we're going to have a brand new book, brand new Golden Nuggets, interview with an author, and you know what I'm doing here every single week, just trying to save you a little bit of time and bring you some information that can spark real change in your life. Fantastic week, everybody. I love you all. The dictator of Tomania the conqueror of Astolich, the future emperor of the world. Speak. I can't. You must. It's our only hope. I'm sorry. I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. 
Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. Only the unloved hate. The unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery. Fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man. Not one man, nor a group of men. But in all men, in you, you the people have the power. The power to create machines. The power to create happiness. You the people have the power to make this life free and beautiful. To make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world, that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! Yeah.